Welcome back to Killer Fun, where we explore the intersection of crime and entertainment every other week. I'm Christy. And I'm Jackie. And we're so glad that you're back with us today. Today, we're talking about America's first serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. It's not, he may not actually be the first serial killer. He probably, in all likelihood, wasn't the first. He just was the first to get caught. Right. He may not have been the first, but it doesn't matter because he still just deserves the title of first for being absolutely <laughs> horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> for being heinous, an awful, terrible, despicable, sick, dangerous man. Yeah. Yes. All I could think at the beginning of this was what if they named this documentary the same way they named the Ted Bundy one, you know, like the shockingly evil, whatever, Mm -hmm. because the first line of this documentary where it's like torture chambers, secret passageways, vats of acid and deadly vaults. I was like, they should have named it that. They they really should have. That would have been a perfect name for it. (laughs) It's anyway. It's uh, man. Heinous is such a perfect word. I don't know that there's another word that's more perfect. No, I mean it's just he's he was an awful man. He was, and it's interesting to hear his own thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. No, oh, yeah, we'll get there. Mm-hmm. We'll get there. So this was an independent film, movie, documentary. I don't know. It's not quite film length. Project. I don't think project (laughs) it's available on amazon prime it's only about an hour or so long so i think that's a good length for it too because it's a little dramatic well i have to admit even though the subject matter was super fascinating and i'm Uh I'm thankful for that um the the film itself made me feel like i was stuck back in seventh grade social studies and it was watch a movie day (laughs) Because it was a really crappy documentary. (laughs) It was really bad. The reenactments were just, I mean, almost as bad as the crimes. It was just bad. (laughs) And I I really struggled to pay attention in some places. But, you know, on the other hand, it was was a really good in-depth attempt to bring it to life. And I appreciate it. But I feel like there were so many other styles of filmmaking and storytelling and history retelling that they could have chosen. But this one really did feel like an after school special. Yeah, it almost felt like a sketch, like practice for the real thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like they were doing this and they were like, they maybe expected something else to come of it. It was weird. I felt like they used a lot of weird reenactment, right? Where they tried to make it feel like it was old and gritty and, you know, and all of that. Like it was really actual old film that they had recovered. But on the other hand, the graphics themselves were pretty horrible for being made in 24 or 2004, right? Yeah. Um, It was pretty, they had more access to graphics and things that they could have used. But instead we saw the same like drawing and the same like face and it was like Ken Burns on this old, old (laughs) photo that was Uh overlaid on this really crappy drawing. And it was just like, ah, it was rough. You were working on a budget, but that's why I mean, like it's almost seemed like they maybe were making this as hopeful that something more would come of it. Maybe so. Maybe so. I hope so. I mean, the story yeah. is phenomenal, and it was really great that they had, um, like, a profiler, right? Yeah. They had really interesting interview people who added a lot to the conversation, I think. But Yeah. Well, let's talk about the guy who made this film, John Borowski. He was the writer and producer, and he's an independent filmmaker. This is his very first credit in IMDb, so maybe that would be something that would speak to the quality. Maybe He's so. New at this. Yeah, that that makes yeah. sense. He was also an associate producer shortly after this on Murder Hotel, which is also about H.H. H. Holmes. So that's oh. kind of why I think maybe he ma- he made this as, "Hey, I can be an expert in H.H. H. Holmes. Let me come and help you make more documentaries or information or something." About this yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so. 
Yeah. It seems like his documentaries are primarily about a single criminal and their crime. So there was a a cannibal named Albert Fish that he made a documentary about, a serial killer called Carl Panzram, an artist, Vincent Castagila, uh, who I think we've talked about before, who paints with human blood. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, He did a limited series called Serial Killer Culture Television uh, about artists and collectors who are fascinated by serial killers. So, yeah, he's got a niche. He does. He does. He seems like somebody in our category. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes. And then there was the narrator, Tony J. I thought he sounded like the voice that narrates... The Haunted Mansion ride in Disney World. He has that particular timbre. It's uh-huh. very old school. Uh huh. Gives it almost a, I don't, not that this was a comedy, but almost like a comedic effect. <laughs> almost, because a it's little, a little over the top. Yeah. It's, it's just a yes, little exactly. much, but it's a uh-huh. little Hitchcockian. You yeah. know, like the, the script, the font they used, and some of the yeah. places you could tell they were going for this Hitchcock effect where it was like they can't show you the gruesomeness, so they're going to build that tension another way. And his narration mm-hmm. was just icing on the cake for that. Yeah, I appreciated that. So he didn't do the voice for The Haunted Mansion, but he does have some Disney connections. He was a voice actor for many, many years, Tony J, And uh, he did voice acting for The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Beauty and the Beast, and Treasure Planet, and then lots of other stuff. Wow. And he had some small TV roles, too. He since passed away, but... That's cool. Yeah. Not that he passed away, that he's... Yeah, right. Yeah, not that he's dead. <laughs> that that he had a cool. long career. <laughs> yes, that he had a good long career. <laughs> I knew what you meant, but I figured... Maybe we should just clarify yeah, that. because out of context, <laughs> and since this is a crime podcast, you don't know. <laughs> then the there was Willie Laszlo, who was the actor, the person who you saw play H.H. H. Holmes in the reenactments, which I don't believe there were any lines in any of the reenactments. It was no. just like him walking around and doing stuff. <laughs> and he's a comedic filmmaker. Oh. Which I thought was... Interesting. Hey, hey, um, brother needs a paycheck. Whatever. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and he's also a camera operator, and his most famous camera operating gig was Ice Road Truckers. Oh, oh uh-huh. I used to love that. I used to really love uh-huh. that. Yeah. I really did. But here's what I thought you would appreciate more. He was also a cameraman on the three-season comedy Betty White's Off Their Rockers, which was a <laughs> hidden camera show. I'm like, Jackie will appreciate a Golden Girl connection. I do indeed. I do indeed. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to recap this? Yeah, let's recap this. <laughs> so it starts at the very end, November 24th, 1894. Dr. Husband, businessman, is a serial killer known as the torture doctor, the monster of 63rd Street, the modern bluebeard. And he's been arrested and detained in Moya Menson Prison. He was born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire in 1861 under the name of Herman Webster Mudgett. He was tormented for being a smart child. And the documentary purports that they were all jealous of his intelligence. And I'm like, they don't know that. I thought that was the very first thing I was like. I too. I thought that was a bit of a, of a, I don't know, taking some liberty. I I I felt like. He ended up being a, he ended up being a serial killer. Maybe he's just a weird kid. Maybe he was. I mean, it is. It's, it's chicken or the egg, right? I mean, like, did they bully him worse than they bullied others because he was odd and there was something weird about him and whatever? Or, you know, was he bullied to the point that it kind of changed his neural pathways and ended up something different? But I, I can't. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> 
he we're hearing him read his own diary, right? Like this is some of the narration yes. we hear. And mm-hmm. so we do hear him talk about a little of a fascination with even though it being awful that what they did to him, he kind of appreciated. So yeah, I feel yes. like uh, he was already headed that way and the kids realized it. Yes. Well, because those tormentors found out that he had a deathly fear of skeletons. And so they forced him to face those literal little skeletons and right. at yeah. the doctor's and, office, which yeah. he in the diary puts as like, that was great. It turned out to be yeah. the greatest thing ever. Yes. It, it enhanced his curiosity. <laughs> yeah. It's so creepy. <laughs> it is really creepy. So then Herman attends the University of Michigan, which was the first university with a hospital attached to it, and excels in chemistry and anatomy. You don't say. (laughs) Right? (laughs) He had a natural proclivity towards those things. You don't say. Mm, Surprising. After medical school, he uh, decides to run some insurance scams using the bodies of unidentified people in order to collect erroneously. And he travels the Midwest working odd jobs, drugstore clerk, asylum attendant, teacher, doctor, all that stuff. He finally decides to settle in Chicago in 1886, a town that was both rebuilding after the great fires in 1871. And that was also preparing for the world's fair. So he changes his name to Henry Howard Holmes to avoid run-ins with the people that he'd wronged over the past couple of years as he did his traveling. I think it was easier to get away with that stuff then. Oh, I think so. I mean, all of it was. I mean, it was easier to graduate from medical school school then. I mean, everything was easier. In some ways. Yeah. For that kind of stuff. Yes. I mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was able to... I mean, nobody's on social media checking up on this guy from town to right. town. You know, <laughs> exactly. um, you could just, you know, change your name. I mean, it yeah. takes a whole lot of effort to track down all of this history, you know, and it's in real time. Jeez, forget about yeah. it. Yeah. Nobody had the time or wanted to take the time to deal with it. Mm-mm. I don't know why they specifically mention at this point in the documentary that he likes Edgar Allan Poe, but they do. They do. And I was like, okay, I guess that's for you to make connections about what was to come. I don't know. I, I think- feel like they wrapped it up in the end a little bit because they do yeah. circle back to it when he talks about the fact that, well, that he feels like he's a certain type of person and yeah. that there was just people who were destined to be certain ways. And, and he throws Edgar Allan Poe again into this conversation. Yeah, he- yeah, it feels like throwing Edgar Allan Poe under the bus a little bit. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I think he's trying to hitch himself to some better coattails. Yes. So Holmes begins working in a family-owned drugstore called E.S. Holton Drugstore. And the owner, Everett, dies of natural causes, quote unquote. (laughs) And then Holmes buys the business from the widow, Claire, and she promptly disappears. Disappears. She disappears. Also in quotes. Uh, Holmes decides to create some phony medicines like mineral water elixir, which is just bottled city water. (laughs) Like, by the way, that was a Golden Girls reference because (laughs) there was an episode where Sophia decides that she's got to make money, right? So she comes in with the water and like, what do you think of this? Would you buy this water? And all the girls are like, yeah, yeah. She goes, we're rich. We're rich. It comes from the hose out back. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. In 1888, Holmes obtains a lease on the vacant property across the street from the drugstore and begins construction. So the building's nicknamed the castle, both because it's very large and also because a vast number of people work on it. So there is a lot of turnover amongst these workers, both because if Holmes fired them and said they didn't do a good enough job, he could avoid paying them. And also because he wanted to hide the true nature of the building, 
Yeah. And if nobody did too much, they wouldn't know what was going on in there. Compartmentalizing the information. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Oh, man. So the castle was three floors. So the first floor, relatively straightforward retail. The pharmacy got moved over there, jewelry store, barbershop, restaurant, a blacksmith. I didn't know in 1888 they still needed a blacksmith in downtown Chicago, but evidently they did. Well, the dude needed some fire, so... <laughs> still get there. choice. Uh, <laughs> and then the third floor was rented rooms and offices and Holmes's quarters where he lived. But the second floor... Oh, this is the most horrible floor. There were dozens of rooms many of them designed for killing. And uh, I was like, this is why you need permits. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you have to have building plans and permits so that stuff like this doesn't happen. Right. There's a room called the maze. There was the asphyxiation chamber, the blind room, a five-door room, which I can only imagine what kind of horrible tears happened there. There was a trap door from the third floor. There were chutes from the roof down to the basement, from the second floor down to the basement, uh, laboratories, and, you know, bathroom, because even horrible people need to pee. Right. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then there was the basement, which Ew. was awful. Ugh. In addition to a bank vault that he put down there, bought on credit, and then refused to pay for, and they couldn't repossess it because it was built into the basement. There were acid vats, quicklime pits, a stretching table, which he called an elasticity determinator. <laughs> Sounds like a rack from the medieval ages to me. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. It was. There was a crematorium disguised as a glass bending furnace, which I hadn't really thought about that, but when you don't have plastic bottles... At a pharmacy, you have to put them in glass bottles. Right. So they would make custom glass bottles for all kinds of stuff. There's so people who collect sense. those things. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's because they broke mostly. <laughs> so, And then there was also a table down there where he cut the flesh off of bodies and so that he could sell his victims' skeletons to medical schools. Oy, that's creepy. So Benjamin Peitzel... Uh, his wife and five children moved to Chicago. Uh, Peitzel is a drunk and a failure at many, many things, but he is a devoted family man. And he's strapping, and his sort of ethically questionable help is just the kind of help that Holmes needed. So the World's Columbian Exposition, what we now typically refer to as the World's Fair, opens in Chicago. It's huge, and it welcomes 20 million visitors from May 1st to October 30th of 1893. That is a lot of people. A lot of people. In 1893, 20 million visitors. I mean, that's, visitors. that's a lot of people now, let alone yeah. for the infrastructure that was available then. Yeah, exactly. So the castle is conveniently located for fair visitors. So Holmes, you know, ran ads, renting rooms, and there were a lot of people who were unknown to the city. People didn't know where they were staying. They just, that boggles the mind, too. You don't have a reservation somewhere. You just go show up in the city and hope that you're going to get a room somewhere. Right. Because how, yeah. how would you, yeah, how would you make a reservation, I don't, really? I, don't know I mean, how you would. there were ways for those who were very well endowed, wealthy, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, no, you just yeah, come if, and do. I can't handle yeah. that kind of stress. Oh, no, me either. That's why you and I weren't born then, because <laughs> it would, it would have been a problem for us. <laughs> you know, that's a perfect situation for a serial killer like Holmes, all these unknown people. And evidently he was also quite the ladies man. Which is Uber surprising. Uh, uh, yeah, he was, I, I mean, I guess, because he had at least the appearance of a lot of wealth. Well, he owned a castle and yeah. he was a doctor. Yeah. I mean, even by today's standards, a castle and a doctor, that would be appealing. 
<laughs> you know, but I really don't think he was a ladies' man as much as his castle and his, you know, credentials were ladies' men. Lady attractors. <laughs> yeah, ladies' <Yeah>. attractors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had three concurrent wives and a slew of girlfriends. I'm going to mention three of the girlfriends right quick. In 1890, Julia Connor and her daughter Pearl lived at the castle. She was in a relationship with Holmes. She became pregnant and wanted marriage, but Holmes said he didn't want any more children. So he would marry her, but only after he gave her an abortion. And uh, he did so. And then Julia and Pearl disappeared. Uh, two years later, 1892, Emmeline Grand was his mistress and secretary. And she was sealed into the vault and suffocated. Uh, and then a year later, 1893, Minnie Williams, his next secretary, I assume, inherited land in Fort Worth valued at $40,000, which is the equivalent to $1.1 million here in 2020. Whew. So quite a valuable piece of land. And Holmes convinced her to sign it over to him, and then he murdered her and her sister. So he was somebody who killed for pleasure, profit, and expediency. Yeah, and I find that to be a little odd. Yeah, that he's got so many uh, motivations. Right, he's got so many motivations, and he is enticed by different goals and different signatures. I mean, he's all over the map. Yeah, which I think is actually more common amongst serial killers than we're t typically led to believe in fictional accounts. They have a, they have a more like goal oriented, either it's profit or expediency or pleasure. You don't see it in all three because it's not a very clean narrative. No, that's but, true. Yeah, that might be true. So Peitzel, the helper sidekick, the sidekick, <laughs> his drinking grew worse and worse. And Holmes was worried that he was going to blab about their misdeeds. And so Holmes convinced Peitzel to take out a large life insurance policy, make his, make Peitzel's wife, Carrie, the beneficiary. And then they would stage Peitzel's death in Philadelphia, as Holmes had a lot of experience with. And then they'd split the money. The men defrauded people all over the country under many names. They were traveling around. I guess they were earning money to be able to take out this life insurance policy. I'm not exactly sure why they had to travel around a while. I actually don't know either. That wasn't very clear. And that was one of the things I was like, okay, but why? I really wanted a little more information from the documentary in that particular part. Yeah, it felt felt kind of strange and I got mm -hmm. lost a little bit. That's where I said I had trouble following and I had trouble paying attention a little bit. I felt like yeah. it got a little, I don't know, wayward at that point. Yeah. And it really did. And I mean, you needed to know that they were going around and doing this. I just wish we would have known what their motivations were or had them tell us that they didn't know what their motivations were because he was trying to defraud another drugstore owner in St. Louis in July of 1894 when he got caught. Right. And this drugstore owner turned him in in St. Louis, and he ended up sharing a cell with a guy named Marion Hedgepeth. Hedgepeth gave Holmes a morally flexible attorney's name. <laughs> To help him out. And in exchange for that, Holmes offered Hedgepath $500, said, once we get through this scam, I'll send you 500 bucks, which is, by the way, like 15 grand in today's money. Yeah, so it, it was, was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. It sounds it small now, but it was a lot of money. You know, he's in jail and somehow his third wife, Georgiana Yoke, is able to come and bail him out. They proceed with this insurance scam, and they set up a business where Pizel goes by the name of B.F. Perry, a patent dealer, which is like an attorney who helps you file a patent. I had to look that up. And an inventor arrives, to use 
Mr. Perry's services and finds Perry, who's actually Pizel, actually really dead. Really dead. Holmes really did kill him. So they send Pizel's 15-year-old daughter to identify the body. But, of course, she's not really, she says it's her dad, but she's not really able to identify the body. They all think that the patriarch of the Pizel family is still alive, but she really is identifying her real father. Which is so, so disgusting. It really is. Right? Like, she thinks that her daddy is alive somewhere and that she's just playing part in this game but that's actually her dad. Oh my gosh. Can you even imagine that kind of betrayal? No. Oh my gosh. Ugh. So the death is ruled accidental and the insurance company pays Carrie pretty quickly. And then Holmes swindles most of the money away from her anyway. And he takes three of her five children with him to go quote unquote, live with their father in hiding. Yeah. This is the creepiest part right here is the, absolute pleasure he takes in just messing with people and he's not just a killer or just a criminal he Mm -mm. really is sort of evil oh i agree because he carts those kids all over and like plays these cruel games with the family it's just it's horrible horrible hedgepath hears that the plan was successful and realizes that holmes Never sent him the money that he promised, the 500 bucks. So Hedgepeth, in revenge, rats him out. And the insurance company sets the Pinkerton Detective Agency out after H.H. Holmes. They capture him. He's in Moyamensing Prison. And the search turns to the missing Pizel children. And eventually, all three of their bodies are found. I mean, what kind of lies did he tell? What stands out to me is they still caught him by following the money. At the end of the day, they still have to follow money to catch these guys. Uh Isn't that weird? It's always the downfall. Always. Holmes pleads guilty to insurance fraud, but insists that Pizel committed suicide. July 19th of 1895, the Chicago police finally get around to investigating the castle. And they find bones, torture equipment, bloody garments, and so much more. There are 50 people who are reported missing from the World's Fair who can be traced back to the castle. But body identification is basically impossible with what was left and what kind of equipment they had available to be able to test that sort of thing. Then the trial of the century starts on October 28th, 1895. Uh, They likened it to O.J. Simpson. Oh, right. Yeah, Yeah. that makes sense. So Holmes dismisses his attorney (laughs) in true uh, mentally ill person fashion. He dismisses his attorneys and then rehires his attorneys when he starts to look bad because the experts make him look bad because... He's bad. He's bad. And what's interesting is how they note the fact that once he fired his attorneys, he was able to get up and walk closer to the jury and walk around. He he had freedoms that, that allowed him to get closer to people. That's scary because you don't know whether he's trying to use that to pull another con or whether he's just getting closer to investigate new targets. You know what I mean? Or just... Yeah. Yeah, new targets, or if he's just taking some pleasure in their discomfort at yeah. what they're hearing. Right. Ugh, it's gross six ways from Sunday. I mean, okay, we've done a lot of, of crime over the last for yeah. uh, long years. And, um, yeah. you know, and it's been really interesting. And I don't know that I have ever used the terms Ugh, or Ugh, <laughs> as much as I have with H.H. H. Holmes. But, like, words cannot describe. And so I'm left with Ugh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. Like, I'd like to go back and see what other episodes did Jackie go Ugh, a bunch because I don't think there was one. I, do- I don't think so either actually because the level of heinousness is just so extreme you're left without words really to describe it 
particularly when you're just watching it or first learning about it, there's no, oh, it's just, yeah, like you said, look, Ooh, <laughs> there's mean, just, you're credit. left with like guttural noises because you don't have the vocabulary to adequately describe this. Exactly. And I think that was a big challenge for this director, for this writer, because it is a really yeah. heinous subject. And I have to say all credit to him in that, even though I definitely found it boring at times and kind of got wayward, the absolute heinousness of the crimes, the oddity of them, the intense amount of, I don't know, just work and intentionality that came mm-hmm. in from this guy, it definitely got across to me. Yeah. It definitely impacted me. And you know what? Maybe we don't need a more exciting version of H.H. H. Holmes. Maybe that's just a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But, but there are rumors, you know. We'll have to talk about that. But there are there are other things out there that may make Mm -hmm. it more alive and and now that i've seen this documentary i'm like cease all do not move (laughs) forward leave this guy Uh in the grave yes Uh, agreed (laughs) agreed so carrie peitzel testifies everyone in the courtroom except for h.h holmes cries because her testimony is so moving and then his wife georgiana yoke testifies and Holmes sobs and he's the only one (laughs) which tells me he didn't know to cry when Carrie testified right and he thought oh everybody cried maybe I should cry when my wife testifies I don't think he was really upset he was just no he was just trying to mimic empathic behavior Mm -hmm. and he poorly Holmes himself doesn't testify much to the crowd that has gathered their disappointment. They're very sad. So the verdict, guilty of murder in the first degree, and he is set to be hanged May 7th, 1896. William Randolph Hearst offers Holmes a lot of money for his confession. And at the gallows, Holmes claims that his confession is a complete fabrication. And he is indeed hanged that day that was sentenced, May 7th, 1896, just nine days before his 35th birthday. He was quite accomplished for someone so young. He was really young, wasn't he? Uh, Holmes requested to be buried in a slab of concrete, almost like, you know, he didn't want his grave robbed or his remains disturbed. Hmm. Interesting. It is weird. I mean, it's a strange request for anybody to be nervous about that. But on the other hand, it's like, what do you know? Well, he sold, how many sets of skeletons did he sell to <laughs> medical schools? A lot. <laughs> that's that's true. I really didn't think about that. <laughs> I, I didn't think about that, that maybe he would be afraid of of that. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, he was totally afraid of having his remains disturbed. Well, it's so funny because, okay, when they talked about that whole idea And the narrator says he would make a killing in Chicago financially and literally. (laughs) I lost it. I had to pause it. I had to pause it. I had to laugh. It was absolutely hysterical. Yeah. (laughs) Holmes had a minimum of nine confirmed victims and may have had as many as 50 to 100. No one knows for sure. And Holmes claimed, this is what you mentioned before, Holmes claimed to have been born with murderous tendencies, just as a poet is born to sing. That was a big wraparound to Edgar Allan Poe. But it is interesting to hear him say that something about, like, Satan was there at his delivery. Like, that he ushered him into this world. I wish we knew more about him personally. If I were to learn anything else, I would want to know more about him personally and what he thought about who he was and everything, because obviously he has some really, really in-depth reflections about that. You know, whether they came later and he looked back on his life and he tried to make meaning out of it by saying, oh, well, I'm just so afflicted by being, you know, delivered by Satan or whether he really felt that way the whole way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But either way, I want to know. Right. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with, is it true? We're going to fact check this. Yes. 
Are you into the secret histories of exorcisms, Christmas massacres, kill dozers, and concert disasters? How about haunted mansions, the Philadelphia Experiment, the Dorm of Death, or candy corn? Then you're going to love Ghost Town, a hilarious and sometimes not so hilarious twice weekly podcast. On Wednesdays, we discuss the secret history of an abandoned, unexplored, haunted, or mysterious place from anywhere in the world. And on Fridays, we cover an amazing historical failure from any time in history. Ghost Town is 100% safe and legal. We guarantee it. It's also fun, spooky, and can contain a riot, a massacre, a murder, or an arch deluxe. I'm Rebecca Lieb. I'm Jason Horton. And And this this is Ghost Ghost Town. Town. And you can find Ghost Town wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. They said that Holmes was bullied because he was a gifted child. You know, that was cited as an excuse, an explanation for Holmes' behavior. Ah. So it got me wondering, are bright children bullied more? In an article in Gifted Education Communicator, they said, from the number of reports we've received from parents of gifted learners, it would seem that gifted students are more prone to being targets of bullying behavior. This is not supported by research. In fact, gifted children, just like their non-gifted peers, can also be bullies. Yeah, that sounds about right. It is hard because I think we do anecdotally sort of think that people are bullied because what do we tell our kids? Well, they're just jealous. Well, they're just jealous. That might be true, but it may not be related to being jealous about somebody's abilities. They may be jealous of something else or maybe jealous of the lack of pressure they have on them to be number one or Mm -hmm. succeed. Right. I mean, there's a lot of reason kids get bullied. It's not necessarily having to do with that. And it's not, and maybe their parents are just more present and paying attention. So they realize their children are being bullied more. I mean, it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation. You can't ever do a survey without taking into account the factor of Mm self-report. What causes somebody to be free and willing and available to self-report these statistics, and it's always a limitation. It doesn't mean we can't find good knowledge from it, but it's going to always be a limitation to what we know for sure. And until we go back and we say, okay, let's actually look at all the bullying cases and and do a causal comparative of what what's happened here, then, you know, everything else is more a reflection of what people feel is happening than what is actually happening. Mm-hmm. To in yeah. a lot of studies, you know, some surveys right. and some tests do a really good job of mitigating that as a confound, but right. And well, and it depends on what you're looking at, right? So yeah. you can't take a test without also testing your ability to take a test. <laughs> Very fair. I mentioned this is why you need building codes. I'm like, were there not building codes in like the 1880s? Right, right. <laughs> so the Encyclopedia of Chicago said that there were indeed building codes from the city's inception in 1837, and they were to reduce the threat of fire and disease. But the Department of Buildings was both understaffed and corrupt, and they could not enforce even the most minimal requirements for building in Chicago at that time. It wasn't until 30, 40 years later that they got decent at it. That's so scary. I mean, you're right. I never really thought about building codes being to prevent torture chambers from being built. But, um, (laughs) you know, now I will. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, you know, maybe that's not their express purpose, but, you know, definitely a byproduct. Right, Uh, a healthy byproduct. (laughs) When was... When was the, the Chicago fire? 1871. Okay. But they were still rebuilding. It was devastating. And they were just so, so overrun by everything that yeah. a guy yeah. actually putting money into the economy by building yeah. up a corner and building something beautiful that had a right. retail space. I mean, this guy, who's checking on this guy? This guy is literally making a difference in the community. And that's what's so scary about these people is that he was so evil and yet he was actually making a difference in his community. He actually dispensed drugs that probably saved people. He probably oh, yeah. actually gave good medical advice to the people who walked in the drugstore. Right. And yet he was torturing people on the other side. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Cool. Above and below. Yeah. Cool. Up in the up on the second floor, down in the basement. Such a conundrum. I I wondered they didn't really give a lot of information about Holmes's wives, only that all three of them lived until their natural death. The famous people had a big long article all about H.H. H. Holmes, but they specifically had a timetable for his marriages. And in July of 1878, he married a lady named Clara Levering. The couple had a son. His name was Robert Levering Mudgett. And he grew up to be the city manager of Orlando, Florida. Really? Yeah. Mudgett. Isn't that interesting? Mudgett. He took the n- name Mudgett. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, because it was before he was Holmes. It was before he was Holmes. And so that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, his second marriage was to Myrta Belknap in January of 1887, so 11 years later. And they had a daughter named Lucy, and she became a public school teacher. And then his third marriage, whom we already know about, Georgiana Yoke, was January of 1894, so not terribly long before he was arrested. And he was still married to both Clara and Myrta. He had filed for divorce from Clara in 1887, but that that had never, the paperwork had never fully gone through. So he never, he did try and divorce Clara, but he didn't ever get it completed and just married these other ladies anyway. Oh, okay then. Yeah. You know, under other names. Right, so yeah. nobody is putting it in a database. No red flags yeah, are popping up. Exactly. Holmes gave a complete confession to Hearst newspapers. Like, wait, what? 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 <laughs> I know. So, yeah. So he actually was paid seventy five hundred dollars by Hearst newspapers for his confessions, and it turned out later that it the confessions weren't entirely true. They had been greatly exaggerated. Some of the people he claimed to have murdered were still alive, and then others were completely unsubstantiated. So we don't know how much of that is actually true. We know he had a minimum of nine victims, but Mm -hmm. we don't know how much of his confession is true as to whom he killed or accurate as to how he killed them. That is so weird. It seems like a weird thing to do to be like, hey, guy on death row, my newspaper wants to give you in the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars in today's money to write your your confession. It's not a thing that would happen now. No, no. They have laws about not profiting off of your crimes. Right. Yeah, you can't profit off of it. But, you know, Mm -hmm. it's also interesting that he would do that and then exaggerate when I feel like there's probably plenty of true details he could have <laughs> yeah. used. Um, and then to just recant. I don't know, man. He's disturbed. He is disturbed. So was Holmes really buried in concrete? <gasps> yes, yes, he was. In fact, Jeff Mudgett, his great, great grandson, had heard that there were rumors that H.H. H. Holmes had escaped the gallows and his great 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 grandson thought he might have been actually Jack the Ripper, which I don't think the timelines quite matched up. I think they were both active at the same time. Kind of ish. Yeah. I mean, Jack the Ripper hit the news before H.H. H. Holmes started most of his, but mm. but they were pretty close together. And you yeah. know, you were gonna have to come on a slow boat from England, so So I don't know that it that would have worked, but He was indeed, they were able to use DNA to prove that the body that they found encased in concrete was indeed Holmes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so they have the familial DNA Mm -hmm. from this great, great grandson who was curious about that. But when they opened it up, they found uh, that the brain inside was still intact. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. And they don't know how or why. What? Wait. Yes. So when they opened up the concrete and found the skeleton in there, his brain was intact. No. And they don't. No. And they don't know how or why. Mummified in some way, I'm sure. What did he do? Did he do something? Did he? I don't know. That's weird. 
Well, did they study it? Do we know? Did they study it? They should study that. <laughs> they, should, they should. The article didn't go into all that. Oh. Just that they don't know how or why. Ah. I know, because he's evil. What? Because when you're not human, then... Uh, <laughs> more guttural yeah. noises because we don't have the vocabulary to talk about this. Right. <laughs> Are killers born, as Holmes suggested? Yeah. There's this article in The Guardian. Nobody knows for sure. It's possible. It's not conclusive by any means. They have done studies and they found that about one in 300 mammals die from lethal violence of one of their own kind. But humans tend to be about 2%. Yeah, it's, it's hard because really all the studies that are out there, I mean, you get this picture of risk factors. Mm-hmm. Like things that we've talked about before, where is you have these risk factors, you know, and it's the diathesis stress model is what is what most people would kind of refer to is that you might have some biological things that are already there and then you have an environmental thing and then something kind of clicks and all of that sort of emulsifies and then you become something. But And they do, they can show where people who are killers and, and certain types of criminals definitely have different brain patterns in some respects that are significantly different, right. you know, and then the question is, where does that come from? Right. Yeah. It's hard to know. Is that a matter of genetics or is that the way the brain formed because of environmental factors? Nobody knows for sure. Well, and I feel like um, you have to choose. I think it is a matter of both. I mean, you can't okay. study an individual without studying that individual in a setting, in a context, right. in an environment. So right. because we can't separate them, we shouldn't. Right. Right. We should pay attention That's to fair. those things. And so when you do that, you can create a model like the diathesis stress model where we can kind of say, hey, these are factors that matter biologically and these are factors that matter environmentally. And so let's not match those two things up, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. because if that's the case, then we've got a problem on our hands, you know. But other than that, like, you know, because you're never going to individuals just simply are in an environment. And I think that's just the mm-hmm. way that we're meant to be. That's fair. I was telling my husband, you know, what I was researching for this episode. And I I mentioned this particular thing. And he said, well, if you couldn't talk to anyone, you'd be less likely to kill them too. (laughs) Because I told him that, you know, most mammals have a much smaller percentage of murder by (laughs) their own kind. He's like, well, if you couldn't talk to him, then you'd be less likely to kill him too. (laughs) We had a good laugh over that. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. It's like the comedy sketch by Zoltan Kazas where he talks about like having to friend people on Facebook, and he's he's all like, you know, the guy down at the gas station, you know, the guy that guy likes football, and that's what you know him for. And you 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 watch football, you watch football, we talk, we blah blah blah, and then you have to friend him on Facebook, and then you're like, oh, this guy's a Nazi. You know, like (laughs) now we know more about each other in some ways, you know, because you can't just be an acquaintance. Yeah. Maybe you wish you didn't. Maybe so. All right. Psychology break. Uh, Yeah. Holmes was a sociopath. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. A a pretty wicked one. Antisocial for Uh sure. Yeah. You know, definitely something's broken in there. But I mean, that's circular logic in one way, too. Because to decide that somebody is is sick because they do things we don't like, yeah. it's a little circular, right? Like, they either have something that causes them to do something, or we say, oh, well, by the fact that they did it, they have this. And it's kind of, if you use it both ways, it's easy to be circular, which is kind of why, you know, spiritually, we tend to talk about these things in terms of good and evil. Mm-hmm. Because there seems to be something about them that is fully psychologically sound and yet doing something totally evil. In fact, the profiler guy was talking about how how unusual it was that he was able to finish school. Right. You know, and that there's things about him. There was nothing that suggested that he was, uh, was, uh, you know, mentally ill, but he definitely was evil. And if you use all of his behavior just to decide, well, that means he's evil, then we're kind of making a judgment call. Mm -hmm. What if people are just legitimately not good people. And that doesn't necessarily mean mentally ill. I don't know. Those are big questions. Yeah. 
Oh, you wow. know, that is a big question. Well, I didn't, that's not what I dove into. I was like, <laughs> okay, so what made him tick? You know, he cited this being pushed face to face with a skeleton as piquing his curiosity. So I thought, what is curiosity? Is there more than one type? Because more, you know, I'm curious about things and I go look them up more, mostly because I'm interested in them. Are there other ways that curiosity can be developed? Oh, That's a yes. good question. Todd Cashdan had an article in Psychology Today, What Are the Five Dimensions of Curiosity? I thought, oh, well, let's have a look at this, see if we can figure yeah. out what, what made Holmes tick a little bit. So there's joyous exploration, which I think is what I talked to you about. You're curious about something, you seek out additional information. Then there's one called deprivation sensitivity, where it's got a more emotional tone with anxiety and tension being really prominent rather than joy. You're kind of seeking to solve problems as well as reduce gaps in knowledge. So I Mm -hmm. think maybe like his, that would be something where his fear, his anxiety that he had was peaked. So deprivation sensitivity. I mean, he might've been joyous and maybe evilness, but so the third one is uh, stress tolerance, like having a curiosity about stressful events Mm -hmm. trying to make you know kind of trying to figure out how to mitigate those morbid curiosity of sorts yeah then there's social curiosity you know wanting to know what other people are interested in and then thrill seeking which i was like "Mm, yeah holmes is probably seeking some sort of thrill um he was willing to take all kinds of risks financial social physical risks to acquire these intense experiences. So that would make sense too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he had a combination of things. Go- I think going he definitely on. did. When yeah. the documentary said that though, all I could think was uh, Batman, you know, like he became what he feared the most. Ooh. <laughs> I was like, maybe if he was born later, he would just been like a comic book nerd. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> that would have been better. That would have been a lot better. (laughs) All right. So real life. So (laughs) Holmes sold mineral water elixir to people. And I was like, is there something like that now? I mean, other than like regular bottled water being, you know, pretty much tap water. Addictive nature of smart water. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) So there were these like water bottles all over Instagram in 2018 with a crystal in it. This is something I missed, but evidently it was like a big deal that people, they would have crystal elixir water bottles. They sold them on goop and they're just a water bottle with this crystal in the bottom. And supposedly when you put your water in there, it imbued the water with different characteristics like give you energy and health and success and love and all the stuff. And evidently it was a big thing because people decided they wanted to try and make their own because the ones from goop were kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. You don't say. And so you have to be super careful about what kind of crystal you're putting in your water bottle because some of them are water soluble and contain materials that are bad for the human body. <laughs> this, wow. this article was so funny. It got to the end and one of the comments, the very first comment was, that was a rather lot of text to say people are morons. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. so interesting. I mean, think about it though. I mean, we definitely buy a lot of different waters. I mean, yeah. smart water and, you know, Fiji water, we buy these things, you know, but then you think of like Coca-Cola, which was introduced as an elixir of sorts for a headache medicine. Oh, well, cocaine mm-hmm. will definitely help that headache. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. but then it, it was so delicious and good that it's continued on. I mean, shoot, right. you know, without with the, caffeine, the cocaine, without yeah. the cocaine, you know, <laughs> um, actually, okay. An aside again. So, you know. 2020 has been weird. Pandemic, 
Uh-huh. You know, like all the stuff that's going on. And so if you've ever been to the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta, you know you get to try <laughs> different things. And one of the ones we used to love to try, because I grew up right outside of Atlanta, so we'd always go to the Coca-Cola Museum, and we always tried it. And when they revamped it and made it even bigger, they kept this, and I was so thankful. But you can try a soda called Beverly. And it's horrible. It's mm-hmm. horrible. I can't I can't understand how Coca-Cola brand made Beverly, and I am so proud of them for never hiding this fact and allowing people to just taste it because it's uh-huh. indescribable. And so there was this meme out there that said, 2020 be like. <laughs> and there was Beverly. a picture of the Beverly <laughs> fountain. <laughs> it's See, hysterical. and it took me a long time. I was trying to figure out, I'm like, why is this funny? I feel like I should know why this is funny because they have a similar sort of tasting venue at Disney World in Epcot and they have Beverly there too. So if you haven't been to the Coca-Cola Museum, but you've been to Epcot Center, you may have also tried Beverly and it's the one that made you go And see, that matches our episode. It does. It fits right in because you don't have the vocabulary to describe the disgustingness of this. Yeah, I can't even describe Beverly. It's just ridiculous. But 2020 and H.H. Holmes be like Beverly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what are some other ridiculous things that people have made money off of? Oh, yeah. Scams, man. Yeah. Yeah. Goggles for dogs called doggles. What? So th- what? <laughs> doggles. What, why? The- why does a go- why does a dog need goggles? <laughs> so when they stick their head out the window, they don't <laughs> hurt their eyes. <laughs> I know it's dumb. I told you these were dumb. That's what- Fabulous, though. I'm so excited. <laughs> Please go on. I know. I'm gonna have to like find some videos of dog dogs wearing doggles because i think it'd be really funny i know you know there's the pet rock oh well yeah and that was like a big thing in the 70s was a huge thing yeah yeah wigs for dogs people are willing to spend stupid amounts of money on their dogs Uh and your dog doesn't need a wig sorry we're just talking i mean we're not talking about like halloween like put a lion wig on them which are probably legit like Wigs? Like a like a hum, like human hair type wig, yes. This is what we're talking about. Oh, um, oh, yeah. okay. Uh, there was a website called. <laughs> it's shut down now, but it was called My Excused Absence, and it would supply people with fake doctor's notes, <laughs> uh, dead family members, fake jury duty, anything to miss work or school hysterical mm-hmm. that's not a scam i mean it's a scam for the people who are like getting these excuses but mm-hmm. like legitimate business there <laughs> yeah <laughs> well sort of they shut it down uh, <sighs> that's so and then funny. there was uh yeah human skeletons being sold to medical students you would think that it didn't happen for like terribly long after h.h H. holmes did that right no 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 in 1981 dr henry Wu went to medical school and he wrote about this on a uh, blog called kevin md back in 2015 how he went to the university of sydney for medical school in 1981 and they still bought real human skeletons as one of their like supplies from the bookstore that they the, bought like the, the students bought it, not the yes. university. No, the students had to buy their own. Interesting. Yeah. And they said that the plastic ones didn't have enough detail for them to be able to utilize that instead of mm. their, uh, instead of plastic ones that they needed. They needed the real thing to be able to study them appropriately. I hadn't thought about this. He said, now they're, they're much better. You can buy plastic ones. Most medical students who are required to buy these do now, in fact, buy plastic ones. And he, but he found it in his closet, like stuck at the back, because he was like, "Well, what am I going to do with this?" 
And I guess he had intended to sell it at one point, but then just didn't. Like he was going to sell it to another medical student. Right. And just kind of, you know, held on to it until he was completely done with his studies and then forgot about it. He was cleaning out his closet and he found his half skeleton because a full skeleton is very expensive. So he only bought a half skeleton. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah. He <laughs> Then he realized he didn't know what to do with it because you can't... You can't throw it away because if you throw it away or bury it somewhere, when they inevitably, it gets found, there's going to be a homicide investigation. Yeah. And it's not like he can just bury it in the bag he bought it with. So it's like clear, like, oh, this was a medical student, whatever, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, you had, they have, they have cremation services that they provide now that you can, how you can dispose of it. And he talked about the ethical ramifications about how he didn't really think about where did the skeleton come from? I mean, I guess part of me thinks universities can procure cadavers that are donated, you know, for those who are so inclined to donate themselves to medical science after the fact that that maybe there's enough coming to a university that each person, but it just seems weird. But I'll tell you what I'd do. Hmm. I'd go to the store and I'd buy me like a fake skeleton Right, mm-hmm. and it comes in those bags. It has a little paper slip with what it's supposed to look like when it's all hung up. Uh huh. And then I take out the fake stuff and throw that away because it looks fake. And then I put the real stuff in there, and then and then throw that away. And people are like, "Oh, this is a really good set." Oh yeah, it's a really good <laughs> set of fake bones. Like I bet that was really cool. That's what I do. Oh, mm-hmm. a little insight into into Jackie there. Well, I, I just feel like finding cremation services would be really hard. Oh, I don't have no, a shoot into my basement. Oh. <laughs> no, I think I'm the cre- cremation services are relatively easy to come upon. Yeah, Call there's all like, kinds so of... I have these old bones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I bet for a f- fairly small amount of money, most any crematorium would take care of that for you yes, now. Yes, especially for a medical doctor calling. It'd be pretty yes, obvious. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is so funny. People do still fake deaths to collect on insurance. A Minnesota man faked his death for a $2 million life insurance policy and then got caught. That They took it out. He faked his death in Eastern Europe in 2011 and had designated his then ex-wife as his or his later ex-wife they took out the life insurance policy in 2010 then they got divorced then he faked his death yeah now he's in prison they even had a funeral service and everything for him in minnesota yep they did he in fact they said that because he died in europe they had cremation in europe and then sent his body back for this service in Minnesota. And there's a real body, real cremated body in this urn, and they don't oh. know who it belongs to. Oh, wow. They still don't know. How, wow. That's just, yeah. wow. There we go. That's all I have for this. Wow. I mean, I think that's quite that's enough. enough. My gosh. There's <laughs> just so much to brain still not deteriorated. That's weird. Uh-huh. I'm just, yeah, mind blown. By all of this. By all of it. He was an evil, evil man. Evil man. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, let's talk about what we're going to do next because I need yes, to like. Next blah. time. Next time we're going to do something a little lighter. We've had Ooh. a couple heavy ones. So we're going to talk about office space next time. <laughs> I love office space. With their time theft from their job and their skimming and their TPS behavior. Reports. Other TPS reports. <laughs> yes. It's going to be We're going great. to laugh next time. Yes. yes, we are. So let's do it. Make sure you find us on the internet. We would love to, for you to connect with us on the socials. Find us on Facebook, Killer Fun Podcast, exploring the intersection of crime and entertainment. Find us on Twitter at Killer Fun Pod or send us an email, killerfunpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, share with your friends and rate and review while we're all yep. stuck in quarantine. Find a way to listen to a podcast doing the shower or go for a walk because you can do that as long as you're not near people. And that's maybe right. just find a new a new normal with that. So share with your friends. It'll be great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bum, 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 bum,
Dadah.